would invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to the book of Titus. This will wrap up our series on caring for each other in the body of Christ. And I'll begin this morning by reading our text, two verses from Titus chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Paul gives here instructions to the church in this letter to Titus. Reject a factious man after a first and second warning knowing that such a man is perverted and is sinning, being self-condemned. This morning, I want to put your hearts at ease at the front end. Uh, We are not in any procedure this morning. Uh, We are not removing anybody from the church. Uh, There are no steps that have been taken waiting for another step this morning. This is a generic sermon From a generic text, you notice here in Titus 3, 10, and 11, no names are mentioned. Paul does not tell Titus, therefore, reject so-and-so, remove so-and-so from the church at Crete. No, Paul is giving general instructions about how the church is to operate. And this morning, this passage serves for us as general instructions about how the church is to operate. Titus, of course, is one of the pastoral letters or pastoral epistles, along with 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Titus is designed by God through the Apostle Paul to instruct the church about how the church is supposed to function. And in this series, we've been working our way through on caring for each other. This is a hard procedure. This is a challenging one, a difficult one. And yet it is part and parcel with what God designs for the church. We've learned thus far that we are to care for one another. We all have a part in the growth and health of the body of Christ. We learned from Hebrews that we are our brother's keeper. We learned in Galatians 6 that all of us ought to have a heart of restoration when we find one another in the perils and straits of sin that has taken hold. We looked at our own character that is required for church challenges in 2 Timothy 2. And then we looked at Matthew 18 and those four specific steps for how to deal with a brother or sister who sins and does not want to repent. And Jesus there very graciously gives a step-by-step checklist for how to walk through that. Again, so thankful for Jesus' instructions. If we had to make up our own, it would not go well. And then we looked last week at the church's role in restoring a repentant brother. So one who has gone through four steps of a church discipline process and then turns and repents has actually done what the church has been longing for, hoping for, aiming at, and praying towards. And what should be the case? Stiff arm that brother? Exclude him for a time? Make him do penance? Now welcome the repentant brother with open arms and a warm heart. Slaughter the fattened calf, buy the Costco sheet cake, have a party. That is what we are to do. And one more piece of this caring for each other in the body of Christ series is this important aspect of how we deal with one whose particular sin fractures churches. And what I want to do this morning is begin just by elevating our thoughts for a few moments about the importance of unity in the local body of believers. And there are many passages to which we would turn. I'll refer to a few. Romans 12, 5. We who are many are one body in Christ. And individually, we are members of one another. That is a reality by design of the church. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 to 13, Paul says, I exhort you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be made complete in the same mind and in the same judgment. I have been informed concerning you, my brother, and by Chloe's people, that there are quarrels among you. Now I mean this, each one of you is saying, oh, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, 
I'm of Christ. Has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And Paul in those rhetorical questions is addressing the factional or divisive nature in the church at Corinth. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 11, Paul says, Finally, brethren, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. And I think Philippians 2 is sort of the trump card on unity and what's required to get there. Listen to Philippians 2. Therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ... If there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, oh, what's coming next? This must be really important. Paul says, then make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Sounds great. Sounds like everything the hippies wanted in the 1960s. How do we get there? This is the hard part. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in you, which was in Messiah Jesus. And there Paul unfolds what it meant for the infinite God to take on human flesh. Such condescension. Infinite humility. And nothing we could do in our pursuit of personal humility will ever come close to rivaling what Christ did. And yet in our humility, we are to imitate him and we are to resemble him and proclaim him. That is a recipe for unity. Fractures in that unity are devastating. Devastating to the church, devastating to its witness, devastating to love. In 1964, on Good Friday, a 9.2 earthquake struck downtown Anchorage. That is the second largest earthquake recorded in history and the largest in North America. It rocked the city for four minutes and 38 seconds, sending an entire neighborhood into the ocean, collapsing the hospital in downtown, separating 4th Street not only by feet horizontally, but also by a whole story vertically, sending a 220-foot tsunami into the shoreline and eliminating an entire village. To this day, there are still salt marshes where all the pine forests have died when the ocean came onto the land. That earthquake was created by a fracture in the earth's crust, and it had devastating effects. When we think about a factious man in Titus, We're talking about a human, a a believer, or a professed believer in a local assembly of believers who is willing and able to wreak havoc by fracturing precious church unity. And it can have devastating effects. In fact, church history is a, a monument to the reality of divisions, factions, factionalism. Churches have come and gone off the scene precisely because of this threat. Let's read together Titus 3.10. If we think about what should the church do with a factious man, we're, we're going to look at the answer to that in really two parts. The first part is the command, and the second part is the rationale. Very simply put, verse 10 gives us a clear, direct, succinct command. And verse 11 gives us the ground or the reason for that command. Verse 10 gives the command, reject a factious man after a first and second warning. The word reject simply means to refuse, to avoid, to have nothing to do with. It is used elsewhere in scripture. 1 Timothy 4, 7, Paul says, have nothing to do with worldly fables. Same word. 1 Timothy 5, 11 
Paul encourages the church at Ephesus to refuse younger widows from the list. What is the list? The list is the list of welfare for old widows who have lived well. Uh, The idea is not reject widows. (laughs) It is that the list for older widows who have lived well is to reject people who don't qualify. 2 Timothy 2.23 uses the same word. Refuse ignorant and foolish speculations. Refuse them. Reject them. Have nothing to do with them. To be rejected here in this verse is to be put out. Put out of the church. Refused by the church. Avoided by the church. And when the church is commanded to do this with one of its members. It means to put the man out of fellowship with the church. It is... He is not to be treated as a member in good standing. He is not to have access to the benefits of life in the body of Christ that he once enjoyed. And the verb form here is specific. It it indicates an interest in the subject. Uh, What I mean is the, the subject of the sentence has an interest in its own welfare. And if the church is to reject the factious man, the implication is the church does so for its own health, for its own benefit. It's not the only reason the man is rejected, but it is a significant reason that a factious man is to be put out so that the church can be well, so that its unity, which is precious to the Lord, can be preserved. Notice verse 9. In this immediate context, Paul tells Titus, avoid foolish controversies and genealogies and strife and disputes about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. There in verse 9, the the command is, stay away from wrong ideas. Keep yourself away from them. And and it's a different word. It's it's a word that that means to uh, keep yourself away from being involved in them. And in verse 9, the the, the realm is in the realm of ideas. Bad doctrine, worthless things. Paul calls them foolish controversies. Discussions about genealogies, and and as you know, he's not talking there about the genealogies in Scripture that are important and profitable for uh, training in righteousness, but the practice of looking at genealogies and and making whole theologies out of things that are extra-biblical. Avoid them, controversies, genealogies, strife, and law disputes. And notice what's in the list is false ideas as well as extra-ideas. Extra ideas as a matter of teaching for the church are actually to be refused and avoided. What is our message? We we have no message apart from the word of God. That is to be the sum and substance of what we say and what we do. There are other places for other ideas and other topics, but the church has to have the word of God as central. And so filling the time, filling discipleship or teaching with extra things, novelties, is not helpful for the church. And Paul says, avoid them. Not just bad doctrine, but extra things. Why? Verse 9, because they produce quarrels. These things only have the benefit of producing arguments. And that's easy to understand. If we cannot ground what we're saying in the Word of God, we can't see it together, then there's no authority, no ultimate authority, no arbiter that decides who's right and who's wrong. The Word of God is the authority for the church, Uh, not a layer of leadership, not the opinions and preferences of men, but the Word of God. But in verse 10, it's not the ideas that are in view, but a man that is in view. Reject a man. And factious here is an adjective describing the man. Not only must divisive ideas be refused, but now a divisive man must be refused. And notice he is called the factious man. Calvin gives a helpful definition of this one. The factious one includes all ambitious, unruly, contentious persons who, led away by sinful passions, disturb the peace of the church. They raise disputings. In short, every person who, by his overweening pride, breaks up the unity of the church is pronounced by Paul to be factious. The idea of factious here, the the word itself means a division maker. That is one who creates strife and division. He instigates fractures in relationship. 
Such a man is one who has an interest in creating divisions. And this fundamentally is a character flaw. Listen to Proverbs 16, 28. A perverse man spreads strife and a slanderer separates intimate friends. In Galatians 5, in fact, you can turn there. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. Paul there in Galatians 5 is making a contrast between spirit-produced realities in the Christian life and flesh-produced realities in human life. And in verse 19, he says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident. They are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, and here's our word, factions, same word here used as a noun, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things, that is those who are patterned by them in an ongoing continual way, will not inherit the kingdom of God. So you understand that Factions, factionalism, being factious, is on the vice list. It's on the list of things that go with immorality, impurity, sensuality, drunkenness, etc. That if those are a characteristic of a man, that is a character flaw, that leads to destruction. These are serious things before the Lord. The root of the word factious has to do with making a choice. It it has as its base just choosing something, uh, a self-chosen path, a self-chosen doctrine, a self-chosen practice, a self-chosen procedure, a self-chosen preference. All of these things can boil up into being factious. It means to take up and choose one's own path, divergent from the other's. This word is where we get our word heretic from. If you were to pronounce it in Greek, it sounds like heretic. It's the word heretic. Now, we think of a heretic in our day as someone who believes and promotes doctrine that keeps people out of heaven. That is a good technical definition of heresy. Doctrine which, if believed, would disqualify you from heaven. Uh, I like that technical definition of heresy. That's going to keep us from calling somebody who doesn't like the same breakfast cereal a heretic. Somebody who differs with us on some theological point, a heretic. Listen, all born-again people are going to heaven. In my view, in, in my use of the word heresy in the English language, I speak of that doctrine which keeps you out of hell. For instance, to, the, to deny the deity of Christ. Or to believe that you get to heaven by good works. Those would be heretical doctrines. Okay? Now, we get our word heretic from the word heretic in this passage. But when Paul used it, it didn't mean heretic in the way that we use it. It simply meant one who divides, has made a a self-styled choice, divergent from others, and creates a division. He does not mean here an unorthodox denial of key truths of the Christian faith. That use of the word came later. Okay, And, and I hope you understand how language changes. In the English language, for instance, the word prevent used to mean to go before somebody to prepare the way. And now, for some reason, it kind of means the opposite. I want to get in your way. Language changes. Uh, This is a good example of that. In Paul's day, the word did not mean a technical definition of unorthodox doctrine. It simply meant one who creates a division, a division maker. Now, all heretics are factious. Right? If you depart from New Testament doctrine, if you depart from Orthodox doctrine and promote some theological heresy, you are a division maker. Some people have said, well, doctrine just divides. We don't need to talk about doctrine all the time. That's so divisive. No, doctrine doesn't divide. Bad doctrine divides. Bad doctrine is a departure from good doctrine. Unorthodox or heretical doctrine is a departure from God's word. 
It is bad doctrine that divides. So all heretics are by definition factious, but not all factious people are theological heretics. Do you understand the distinction? In this passage, the word used here merely means a schismatic, one who breaks away, one who creates divisions. Factious is an adjective describing the character of a man. A factious man desires to win a following. You see, if he splinters himself off from the church for some reason, the factious man doesn't want to be alone there. He desires for others in the church to join him on the island he's made for himself. He is against the grain of the church. Perhaps he's against the grain of the shepherds of the church, and and he wants others to go against the grain with him. And whether or not he is successful in garnering a following does not determine the character of the man. His heart is what his heart is. A man who is attempting to get a following against the unity of the church is a factious man, whether or not he has one follower or many followers. Now, why would a man want to create divisions? Who would want to get into a group of people that think the same and love each other? Why would he want to get in there and start making cuts? Fractures, followers for himself against that culture and that community. I'm going to suggest a few motivations. Number one, pride. Some factious men are just driven by pride. The the pride of being loved, being popular, being esteemed. It is the pride of prestige. It is the pride of having followers. Perhaps it is the pride of intrigue and secrecy. I know something you may not be aware of about this church, about this doctrine, about why this church does something, about the leadership of the church. I know something. And that man wants people to go along with him because it strokes his pride. A second motivation could be this, doctrinal deviancy. A man just finds himself to believe something different than that community of believers. And says, it's not enough for me to just think differently. I want other people to think differently. I want to disciple people in my differences. I want them to follow me because it may lend credibility to my ideas. If I can be compelling, if I can be winsome, if I can get people to follow in my wake and in my train, then I can have some confidence that this doctrinal deviancy is right. A third potential motivation would just be sin. That is, sin that does not want to be exposed. A a division can be a diversionary tactic. I don't want to be shepherded away from some sin, so I must begin to take up some cause against the unity of the church. It's a distraction. It's a tactic to get people off of my trail. Maybe when they see something in my life that is off. I don't want to be shepherded. I don't want people poking around my life. So I'm going to complain about the color of the carpet. Or some procedure. Or maybe doctrine. And when you think about these motivations. Pride, doctrinal deviancy, or just sin that doesn't want to be touched. There's overlap. There may be all three involved. For instance, if I'm sinning and I don't want to repent, and I don't want the shame of my sin to be the issue that gets known, I will make the issue the way that it is handled. Or some other issue. This church doesn't do X, Y, Z correctly. Or this church has always believed a doctrine that, you know, I just disagree with. And now the issue has shifted to procedures and practices and beliefs instead of the shame of my sin that I won't let go of and don't like being addressed. And I may get some followers. I may get some sympathizers who for various reasons are willing to be allies with me against the unity of the church. And listen, sympathy is easy if I am also being addressed by God's word that make me uncomfortable. Boy, that divisive guy is complaining about the way the word of God is being preached. I'm feeling it too. I have an ally and a coalition can build. If the issue is doctrinal differences, 
If I choose to adhere to some deviant teaching, bad doctrine, different doctrine, extra doctrine, and I don't want to be alone in it, then I may seek out some others to join me on that island away from the body. And because I prize my own thoughts more highly than I prize the unity of the church, I'll be happy to draw others away. And it may start out as doctrinal, but make no mistake, it very quickly overlaps into categories of sin that refuse to be addressed. And listen, if you can discredit someone in your life because of some difference in procedure or some difference in teaching, all of a sudden you have a category for discrediting them. So when they come to you in love and they say, hey, can I help you see your blind spot? You're like, yeah, I don't believe you on this doctrine, so I don't have to listen to you on this life issue either. And then the sin and the doctrinal things overlap. And thirdly, at the starting point of the divisiveness is just plain and simple pride. Hey, I want to be popular. I want people to like what I'm saying. Then it doesn't matter what doctrines I gravitate to. I just pick something and it's different. I start saying it. I get some big words. I start impressing people and I get a following. And, and I have discovered that people who gravitate towards factionalism for that reason will abandon the very doctrines they championed a week later when they find some new fad theology to hold on to and get a following with. And they can jump from doctrine to doctrine to doctrine. And it was never about the doctrine. It was just about pride. All of these motivations overlap each other. They all have a common denominator. It is a love of self. It is a love of self over and against the love of others. And listen, church, we are all vulnerable. We're vulnerable as individuals before the Lord on every aspect of this discussion. We all have pride. We all think differently than each other. And we all sin. All of those are fertile soil for us being factious. And the church is vulnerable. The church is vulnerable to those who are factious. The church is vulnerable corporately. And a Christian is vulnerable individually when, number one, we are not adept at biblical communication principles. If we slack on how we communicate with each other, we will be vulnerable to following the factional guy. Listen to Proverbs 18, 17. The first to plead his case seems right until another comes and examines him. The guy who seeks to make a division will lead into conversations and relationships and be the first to plead a case. And it sounds right. It sounds compelling. And listen, if you're a Christian with a tender heart and you love the brothers and the sisters in the Lord and you love believes all things, why would I doubt what this person's saying to me? It just seems reasonable. Why would they make something up? I, of course, I have to believe it. And what if it's not true? What if there's another side to the story? Proverbs 18, 17 just gives us this caution that the first that comes and pleads a case seems right. And then you go and listen to the other guy. Does that mean be suspicious of everybody whenever they tell you something? No, I still want love to believe all things. But love believing all things means I believe the first half of Proverbs 18, 17 and the second half of Proverbs 18, 17. And when they differ, I might have some work to do. I might have some praying to pray. I might have some questions to ask. But it does mean we should not be naive that when one has an intention to bring division, we can be vulnerable. If we're not remembering a principle like Proverbs 18, 17. And then if we're not remembering something like 1 Timothy 5, 19, don't receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Or Proverbs 20, verse 19, he who goes about as a slanderer reveals secrets, therefore do not associate with a gossip. That's a prohibition. Somebody just is known for walking around giving juicy tidbits of information they shouldn't share? Don't associate. That's a biblical command for communication principles. If we are not staying on short accounts in our communication, if we're not being guided by biblical principles, we will be vulnerable. Secondly, the church and individual Christians are vulnerable. 
Because juicy gossip is attractive to our hearts. It just is. We are intrigued by salacious details of other people's lives. We are easily suspicious of others' motives. We are eager to be the first to hear and then the first to pass along some tidbit of information. Thirdly, we're vulnerable because or when unity is not prized. Unity in a local body of believers is not valued. Unity is not protected. Unity is not prayed for. Unity is not loved. To protect ourselves, we just have to love the unity of the church. To protect the church from myself, I must love what Jesus loves about life in the body. We're vulnerable, fourthly, when in place is not the Holy Spirit, discipline cultivated fruit called self-control. Self-control, it's a fruit of the Spirit, it is a discipline to be cultivated, it must be there or we will be vulnerable. Fifthly, we are vulnerable when we're not on short accounts with each other as it relates to sin. Regular patterns of confession, regular patterns of forgiveness extended, love and mercy and kindness, reconciliation, that ought to be normal body life in the church. And when it's not, resentment, bitterness, suspicions, Listen, we will sin against each other. We've talked about that in this series. If we're close enough to each other, we're, we will be close enough to sin against others and be sinned against ourselves. And we must be humble. And we must go vertically to God through the cross of Jesus Christ and horizontally with each other to confess sin, to ask for forgiveness for sins, to extend forgiveness with a heart ready to forgive at a flash, to love one another deeply. We must do and practice all of those things. And when those things are not happening, we sin against each other, we don't address it, and you just get bitter. You keep accounts of sin. You remember sins. You start to hold sins against each other. And then when there's a difficulty, all of that pile of resentment comes piling down into the relationship. Bitterness, suspicions, Unforgiveness, they are all fertile ground for division in a church. Loving each other well, being on short accounts, confessing and forgiving builds trust. Listen, someone comes into the body of believers and and tries to break up a unity forged in love where people sin against each other and they know it and they confess and repent and are reconciled. Boy, it's it's hard to break those ties of love when somebody wants to come in and divide. But if we do not love each other well, and again, it requires time, communication, humility, selflessness, that whole list in 1 Corinthians 13 about what love is, it requires all of that. If we're not loving each other well, then there are likely cracks already beneath the surface. And some disruption, some jostle by someone actually trying to create a division will have widespread devastating effects in the church. That we're vulnerable. Paul says, reject a factious man after a first and second warning. This is really important. Verse 10 does not end after man. Reject a factious man. Remove him from the church. Now what follows is leniency, understanding, time, Kind, gracious instruction and warning. Listen, the church just can't merely pronounce someone factious and remove them from the fellowship. There must be a first and second warning. And the first and second warning, I believe, ought to be clear and direct with this passage open so that somebody knows what they're being told. I don't believe that the church should practice a, well, I, I kind of gave him a general warning. I don't know if he would have heard it that way. But in my mind, it was Titus 3.10. Now, I think we ought to sit down, open Titus 3.10 and say, brother, this is Titus 3.10. I'm reading it to you right now. <laughs> a warning here is a heavy word that, that carries with it both the weight of instruction and admonition. And the emphasis in this passage is on the warning side of it. Instructions is included, but it is a warning against improper conduct. And what are the warnings designed for? 
The warnings here are designed to inform the mind and warn of the dangers so that the divisive man will turn from his ways. Listen, this is hope. This is mercy. This is believing the best, love, hoping all things. We think he can be turned. Here, here this man, wittingly or unwittingly, is creating fractures in the church, the church that Jesus loves and the unity that Jesus commands his people to protect. And yet still for the man doing this, hey, let's sit down. Let's talk about this. Let's renew our minds together about unity in the church. Let's be on short accounts of sin. Brother, turn. These warnings are kindness from the Lord. Now we might ask, is Titus 2.10 a a two strikes and you're out passage or a three strikes and you're out passage? He says, reject a factious man after a first and second warning. Does that mean warning number one, strike one. Warning number two, now leave. There is some debate about that. I take this as a three strikes passage. Give a warning. Give a second warning. And after that, if there is still divisiveness, he is to be rejected. Again, gracious from the Lord, hopeful from the Lord. And and it's so good that God is clear in his word and actually gives instructions for these difficult things. We, We wouldn't pick these plans. Either our vindictiveness would be fleshly, Or our leniency, what we might think is leniency, or what we might mistakenly call grace, would lead to the destruction of the church. And God's given a blueprint. Paul commands Titus, after the first and second warning, to reject him. And here's the truth, Christians. We must all turn away from divisiveness all, all the time, right away. If somebody is a gossip, break the chain. Avoid it. If somebody brings an accusation against an elder without two or three witness, you are to reject it. Avoid it. Do not give it a hearing. Apply Proverbs 18, 17. Recognize someone comes and tells you something. Uh, Maybe I need the other side of the story too. That we are always to be doing those things. We are not to give ears to divisive words. But the church is not to reject the factious man until there is a clear first warning and a clear second warning. Why? Because like the other passages we've looked at in this series, there is hope. There is to be hope in the heart of the church. We all sin. We can all get here. We need to look at the rationale for this command. It's in verse 11. Paul says, Knowing that such a man is perverted and sinning and is self-condemned. Why must such a man be rejected if he refuses gracious and clear warnings about being divisive? Paul tells Titus, knowing. This is the cause of the command. It's the basis or the ground of the command. Verse 11 answers the why question from verse 10. Why should we reject him? Because you know something, Titus. And the implication there is Titus ought to know the character of the man already from what has been happening. If the character's not on display, the man's not a candidate for being rejected as a factious man. And the church ought to know these things too. These are realities that Titus must realize. These are realities that we must come to grips with. The issue at stake, according to verse 11, is not information. It's not doctrinal differences. It's not procedural differences. It is the man's heart condition. Now look at it again. Knowing that such a man is perverted... And is sinning, being self-condemned. Such a one is perverted. Literally, such a one has been perverted. It's in a perfect tense. It means he has been turned inside out. That's the literal rendering of the word. He has been warped and he's currently in a warped state. He's not thinking straight. He's not behaving straight. This man has gone off the track and he has not gotten back on the track yet. He, he went inside out at some point in the past, and he's still in that inside out condition. And notice Paul says he is sinning. Now this word is in the present tense. It means an ongoing, continual state. An unbroken state. If, if he truly is a factious man, a, a division maker, twisted in his mind and in his thinking, and, and off the tracks, 
then he is in a current, ongoing state of sinning against the Lord and sinning against the church. The very act of bringing division in this way is sin. And then Paul says, he is self-condemned. He is self-condemned. That does not mean that the man himself is standing up and saying, hey guys, I know that I'm condemned. I'm condemning myself. That's not what self-condemned means here. It means that his condemnation is self-evident. He is not godly. He's not humble. He is disruptive. He seeks to separate friends from each other. He seeks to separate elders from each other. He seeks to separate sheep from shepherds. And think back with me for a moment to a parenting principle. Okay, if, if, if you are parents, you have wrestled with this already. If you're a kid under your parents' home, maybe you've tried to implement this strategy. The parents are already laughing. You know the strategy I'm talking about. The kid wants what he wants. And dad says, mm, no. What does the kid do next? Go ask mom. And the older the kid gets, the more adept at this strategy the kid gets, the more he is able to be wily in it. He might even say, well, mom said, if I ask you this, blah, 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 then you'll say yes. When mom said no such thing, or maybe she used those words, but you know she meant something totally different. And these conniving strategies get more and more complex as the kid figures out, okay, how do I drive a wedge between mom and dad so that I can have what I want right now? That's the motivation, and there are ready means available. Look, it is not terribly difficult to turn people against each other. It's just immature. It's just wrong. I want to get what I want. And I'm willing to insert myself into a sweet relationship and break it apart so that I can get what I want. And for the kid with the parents, this relationship has a unity that is in the child's best interest. Listen, kids do better when mom and dad love each other. That is a universal historical maxim. We see it play out time and time again. Mom and dad are a team. When they are a team, when their first love is the Lord Jesus Christ and their second love is each other, it's okay for kids to be third. In fact, kids do better when they're third. Elevate kids out of proportion so that they have a higher rank than the marriage relationship or out of proportion so that they have a higher rank than obedience and fidelity to God. That's idolatry. Things do not go well for the kid. You want the kid to do well? Mom and dad have to maintain a sweet unity. And that means mom and dad start to sniff out that strategy. Hey, wait a second. What did mom really say? Mom, come in here. We're talking about this together. Similarly, my well-being as a Christian is dependent on the unity of the body of Christ. The unity of leadership in the church. We do better when wedges are not driven in between people in the church. If the kid wants a toy, a privilege, or some relief from discipline, and he knows he can get it by setting mom and dad against each other, he's actually being self-destructive. And the divisive man, short-sighted, wants what he wants, knows how he can get it by dividing people in the church against each other. He himself is short-sighted because such activity is self-destructive. His well-being spiritually benefits from the sweetness of the way God designed unity in the local body of believers. All of this means that the device of man is spiritually a threat to himself while he is simultaneously a danger to the health of the church. Whether the motivation is the, some difference in doctrine, practice, or preference, or whether it's simply the pride of wanting a following, or whether it's the desire to cover up and protect some darling sin, all of it 
reveals an underlying self-will, selfish motives, a lack of humility, a lack of consideration for the welfare of the body and for the unity of believers in that body. Now, why is this process outlined in Titus 3, 10, and 11 a little bit different than Matthew 18? Did you notice that, by the way? Titus 3, 10, and 11, reject a factious man after a first and second warning. What do we look at in Matthew 18? Four, if you count the restoration, five steps. It's a little different. What is not included in this process that is included in the Matthew 18 process? Did did you catch it? It's step three. Tell it to the church. In the Matthew 18 process, if your brother sins, go to him in private. And if he listens, you've won your brother. If he does not listen, take two or three so that everything may be established. And if he listens, you've won your brother. If he does not listen to the two or three, tell it to the church. Not tell it to the church that he's out. Tell it to the church so that he may listen to the church. That is, the the church is invited, compelled to enter into that sinning brother's life and plead with him, speak with him, appeal to him. He stiff-armed the one. He stiff-armed the two or three. Surely the expanding circle of weight and love from the whole church will say, give up this sin, it's killing you. Come back, we love you. And step four is, if he does not listen even to the church, if he refuses that, stiff-arms the whole church, then treat him as an outsider. What step is not in the Titus 3, 10, and 11 procedure? Step three, tell it to the church. Get the whole church to to meet with him. Paul does not say that about the factious man. That is an interesting difference. It's a significant difference. Why is that there? Why, Why is it different? Imagine for a moment that that a man's sin is being a cheat in his business dealings. Just hypothetically. Somebody knows about it and cares enough to go to him. And he says, I don't want to change. And, and that one who addressed it might retreat, pray, think about it. Go to him again. In fact, step one, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, can go on and on and on. We shouldn't expect that somebody has the exact right, humble, submissive, repentant response the first time we address something in their lives. I'm not like that. I'm like a cat in a corner with my claws out. Somebody wants to address something in my life. No, ah, no, ah. Okay, second response. Yes, you're right. Thank you. So we're willing to have multiple conversations in step one. Even with the two or three, in the history of Grace Bible Church, these things have dragged out weeks, months, years in a church discipline process. And and, and there's something that's noble and okay about slowing that down. He says, I don't want to change. Uh, Well, we're going to go slow. We're going to try to help you. We're, We're going to confront, admonish, encourage, multiple conversations, four steps. And what a grief it is when a man rejects all of that kindness. But if the sin is, you know, I want to fracture the unity of the church. (laughs) Do you understand the difference? There's a different procedure. In God's design, there is a different procedure for such sin. The church is vulnerable in that unrepentant sin, in different ways than the guy who happens to be cheating in his business practices. Now, you can have both. A cheat in business can also want to divide the church. Sometimes there's overlap. But there's no step three. No command here to Titus to tell it to the church, to invite the whole church, go meet with the guy. Go meet with the sister in the Lord. Go meet with the divisive woman or the factious man. Spend some time, you know, listen to their hearts. Appeal to them to turn from their sin. To encourage the church to go to the factious man puts the church in danger of the very thing the factious man wants. And God knows that. So the procedure is truncated. And the speed is different. See, divisions create confusion, anger, bitterness, 
choosing of sides in the church and immediately become destructive to the whole body. When you pit yourself against someone in the church or against the church as a whole, you will look for other people to validate your position. Allies, confidants. And such friends help soothe the feelings of isolation. They may, may help falsely soothe your own conscience. Make you feel less alone from the consequences of making your divisive choices. But the effect on the church is going to force people to choose sides, choose loyalties, and rifts run quickly through the whole body. Now you may be asking yourself, in all of this, what about Athanasius? What about Martin Luther? I mean, isn't there a time to make a division? <laughs> yes, big asterisk, big footnote right here. There is a time to be a man contra mundum against the world, one man against the world. Now, I don't think Athanasius was really alone. I don't think Martin Luther was truly alone. We read about them in their biographies and they feel more alone perhaps than they were. But they were courageous and they stood when they had very few allies. And they stood against world powers who had wrong doctrine and no gospel. Athanasius stood against the pastors who were preaching that Jesus wasn't God. And Luther preached against the corrupt medieval Christianity that had lost the gospel and buried the Bible. Should they have stood up? Yes. Did you know that Martin Luther remained in the Catholic Church for some 20 years after nailing 95 theses to the church door at Wittenberg in 1517? Pleading with the people in that community to believe the gospel. You see, a contention rightly held over truth doesn't have to be held by a contentious man, but a courageous, humble one. There's the footnote. Is it wrong for me to think differently about something than others in my church? Of course it's not wrong to think differently than others in the church. We all think differently than every other person in this room about some things and maybe many things. It's okay to have different opinions. It's okay to have different preferences. That's the norm in the body of Christ. We are not clones. Loving each other in our differences is a critical part of our body life. I would refer you back to when we were in Romans 14 and 15. And how do we deal with each other in terms of preferences? Even having theological differences is not a threat to real unity in the body of Christ. So we're not clones theologically either. We're all learning. We are all students of the word of God. None of us yet has it all wired. I don't believe anybody in this life gets it all wired. And we work hard to, to learn and study God's word accurately. But we will find differences amongst each other. That doesn't make anybody factious. The factious man, again, has a character problem. He does not prize the unity in our diversity in the church. And he's willing to break up that unity in order to get something that he wants. Turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 16. Here we get another command with a window into the character flaw behind the scenes. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. I urge you, brothers, keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances contrary to the teaching which you learned and turn away from them. Why? Verse 18. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. By their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. Do you understand what's at stake? God's people and real unity around the truth in the church. In college, I had a really remarkable privilege of serving as a music leader in a Presbyterian church. I was not Presbyterian before I went there. I'm not Presbyterian now. There are doctrinal differences, there are procedural differences, differences in church government, differences in traditions and practices, and yet that was a church that loved the gospel and opened God's word every week. In fact, that was the place I first heard a sermon by R.C. Sproul, and my mind went, <clears throat> and I fell flat before a great big God I had not noticed in my Bible before that point. 
I will be eternally grateful for that Presbyterian church. And they let, they let me serve as a, as a music leader on Sunday mornings. Um, the pastor even let me preach one time. He should not have done that. I had no idea what I was doing. Thankfully, it was not recorded and you cannot look it up. <laughs> that church was really sweet. I, I was not an elder. So it was not my responsibility to make decisions about baptism or covenant theology or anything else. Not even the music style. I just did what they told me. It was a great place. I learned, I served, and I grew. And listen, many of you have done that in various churches in various places where just faithfully you served and you recognized your differences and you loved the body of Christ. In fact, some of you this morning are doing that here now. Praise God. That is a character disposition. Let's think practically for a moment. What, what does it mean in real life to put someone out of the church for being factious? To reject, to refuse, to avoid? Listen, when the church is commanded to do this with one of its members, it means to put the man out of fellowship with the church. He is not to be treated as a member in good standing. He is not to have access to the benefits of life in the body of Christ that he once enjoyed. This is hard. This is heavy. What if that one is a spouse? Have you thought about that? What if the divisive woman is a wife or the factious man is a husband and the other is still in the church? See, there are human relationships that still biblically must be maintained even when the church relationship is severed. What if the factious man is an employer? What if the factious man is a next door neighbor? Christian, you must sell your home. No, that's not the injunction. The command here to reject, refuse, and avoid is in the realm of church unity and the body of Christ. You are not to entertain a relationship that conveys the idea that, yeah, we're brothers and sisters in Christ and it's just great, we're in good standing and we have sweet fellowship. That is not the case. The factious man has broken down relationships in the church. We have hope. Those can be mended. And the factious man can be won. But until then, the relationship is fractured. And he is to be put out, rejected, not given access to the joys of body life that he had. You cannot treat her as you would a sister in the Lord in good standing in your church. That outstanding break in the unity of the church was important to God. Unity is precious to God. You cannot de decide for yourself that Christian unity with the divisive one is more precious than Christian unity in the body of Christ. You and I aren't free as individuals to make that decision. You may, and in some cases you must, continue interactions in the realm of human relationships outside the church. A spouse, an employer, extended family member. And you should do those things well and with love in those capacities. Those are particularly tough situations that are not easy to navigate. Yet even the removal from access to good standing Christian fellowship is not without hope. The divisive man is not in a good place spiritually. And the hope is that if he has disallowed access from the group of people that love him and longingly pray for his repentance and return, the hope is that like Matthew 18, step five, the sifting of his flesh will result in a homecoming celebration. That's our prayer. That's our hope. And listen, all of us, if left to ourselves, would wind up in that same spot. Have you left yourself to your own devices? Ever? Isolated yourself and your own thought processes? Disregarded the counsel of others because you were the smartest man in the room in your own mind? Have you done that? That is in all of us. And that's the, that's the recipe for being a factious, divisive person. And for wreaking havoc in a precious body of believers and creating fractures that will have devastating consequences for years to come. The reason that's in all of us is because we are all born of the same stuff. Christian, you know 
You are here in good standing with God and with fellow Christians in a local body of believers, not because you were smart enough to figure that out. Not because you deserve it or were good enough somehow, but solely because of the grace of God in your life. What separates you from unbelief in the world? What keeps you from all the things you would make of yourself if left to your own devices? God's sustaining grace. We have much to give Him praise for. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, perhaps you know that your heart is hard. Perhaps you know that you have sins unforgiven and if you were to go and meet Christ this afternoon, it would not go well for you. Friends, would you turn and receive God's lavish grace in His Son, purchased by His blood at the cross, freely available to all who would come and simply believe that He paid for my sin? We have some people that will be in a, on the hallway or on the, against the wall over here by the door. If you want to pray after we sing a final song, if, if you want somebody to care for you spiritually, if you want to be introduced to how you can know Jesus Christ and have your sins forgiven, our friends there would love to spend time with you. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for your instructions. We thank you as Lord of the church, as head of the church, that you have seen fit not to leave us adrift, to not know what to do in challenging, difficult situations, to not be forced to make up a script on our own. And we confess these things are hard. I pray that we would love unity in the church the way you do, that we would strive for it, pray for it. And we pray, God, that you would make us people eager, ready to forgive, ready for a celebration for all who would turn and be reconciled. And we ask that you'd be glorified in this church. In Jesus' name, amen.